We're going to call the meeting of the Public Safety and uh, Security Policy and Finance to order. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to another fun year of uh, some interesting debate and topics. Uh, we have a few just, just a few minor changes this year. Uh, the rules, for those of, uh, interested, the rules will not change. They will stay the same. Uh, we do have uh, a new member this year. We have Representative Booglum, who's uh, rejoining us. Uh, he was on this committee uh, four years ago. Yep. And he's uh, we're welcome to have you back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, the uh, vice chair this year is uh, Representative Lomar. We also have uh, Jeremy Hansen as the committee legislative assistant. Uh, we have a new researcher on our side of the aisle with uh, Jason Rector, and we're, uh, and we have uh, Paige Emmett. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Hi, I'm Emmett. Um, just graduated from college. I'm from Winona. Um, grew up on a farm there and moved to Minneapolis and decided to set up man. So. Oh, welcome. I'll sign Thank you. Uh, just so you're aware, what I learned under the previous chair, by taking a roll call, people are usually here on time. So we will continue doing that. If, we're, if we start on time, we usually can get done on time. Johnson. Here. Lomer. Here. Hillstrom. Here. Becker Finn. Here. Considine. Here. Dean. Here. Frankie. Here. Grossel. Here. Howe. Thank Lucero. You. Newberger. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Here. Booglum. Yep. Ward. Here. Zerwas. Okay. Uh, we also have the uh, need to approve the minutes. Do I have a motion for that? If everybody had a chance to look at the minutes. Any correction? No. Representative Dean moves to uh, approve the minutes. Yes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Today we're going to be uh, having an overview of what the uh, working group on untested rate tips and uh, a presentation by them, figure out what happened, how this happened, and we'll get started started with that. Um, I believe it's uh, Caroline Palmer. You want to get things started and inter. In, in, Introduce yourself and Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Caroline Palmer and I'm the Public and Legal Affairs Manager at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity today to talk about rape kits here in Minnesota. And I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the work group efforts that have been in place for about the past year and a half almost. And then you're going to hear from uh, a few speakers to talk about their roles in working with rape kits and uh, definitely want to hear your questions. This can be a kind of complex topic sometimes, so please be sure to ask questions. Wherever we can, um, we can uh, hopefully give you additional information. So the first thing I wanted to let you know is this whole process has been sorted, supported by the Office of Justice Programs in the Department of Public Safety and really the goal of this was to create a multidisciplinary process so that all of the different players in the system essentially who come together to deal with rape kits can have a place at the table and we can work through all of the issues that come up. And again, this has been a very complex conversation. Um, we all have different roles to play, different laws that we're following and different obligations. So pulling all of that together in a coordinated manner, I think has, has been a, a great testament to how well everybody has worked together because this can be an area where there's just a lot of questions. So we brought together as many different disciplines as we could and you're going to hear from some of them today. We, we definitely wanted to make sure that we had everybody who ever comes in contact with a kit and that starts with uh, medical and you're going to hear from a sexual assault nurse examiner today who's going to talk about what happens when a kit is collected, the whole process and what happens once that kit um, is actually done and a decision is made whether to move on. You're going to hear from law enforcement and their perspective of what happens if they pick up a kit 
and what they do with the kit in their custody and what happens as they move it forward to the BCA or other crime labs for testing. And then you're gonna be hearing from the laboratory as well. And they can let you know what actually happens to that kit when it comes through their doors. So we'll be walking you through that process. But also along the way, we heard from victim advocacy they are the ones who are in the hospital rooms working with victims. They are the ones who are helping to keep them on top of the process. And so they were at the table as well as child advocacy centers. And they are the centers around the state who work with children and young adults, well not young adults, but adolescents who have been sexually abused. They do the forensic interviewing and they do kits, uh, kit collection as well. So they were in the conversation. Hospitals, of course, have been a big place in this role. The counties, because they're responsible for paying for kits, have been in the conversation, and multiple state agencies as well. So we did everything we could to bring together as many different uh, stakeholders into the conversation. We had five su subcommittees, as well as our sort of overall work group. Um, we had billing, testing, training, youth, and tribal. And I'll just give you a brief overview of what each group did. And really today you're gonna hearing a lot about the testing side of things. But the billing group was dealing with how do we coordinate various issues around the state because we have a county by county based system. Things can get handled differently in different counties. And so what can we do to maybe talk about consistency across counties so that we can have the same expectations as a victim comes forward and asks for payment of their cases. Um, testing, um, that is actually when it's coming into the crime lab and what is the process that we do to get kits actually into the lab for testing. I know we've heard a lot of conversation on a national basis about a kit backlog and we're gonna address that a little bit today. Training, a big part of that is making sure we actually have people around the state who can do these kits, the forensic examiners. And in greater Minnesota, that's a real challenge, I'll say. And uh, Linda Walter, who will be up here, who does some of this training, is doing a lot of work to get emergency room staff through sort of basic eight hour trainings in place, as well as trying to offer more 40 hour certification trainings for sexual assault nurse examiners. So we really need more people on the ground who know how to do these kits. With youth, we were making sure we wanted to um, coordinate between the child advocacy centers and sexual assault nurse examiners so that youth have the access to kit testing as well and the interview process and everything that supports them with system engagement. And then finally, tribal. We need to look at sort of the multi-jurisdictional piece of all of this. We have states coming together, we have county coming together, and we have tribal governments. And sometimes there are issues that may be different across those different governments. And so we wanted to make sure that everything we talked about had an integrated element that has to do with responding to tribal governments too. I think we basically talked about that slide. But this one, intersection of response, many of you who were here in recent years remember um, some legislation that passed into law that was an audit. And essentially it asked all law enforcement agencies around the state to do a count and figure out how many unsubmitted kits they might have sitting in their property rooms. And so the number that came out was 3,482. And so um, when we have our testifier from the BCA come up, she'll talk a little bit about the process of handling those kits. But I will say right now, as we talk about the legislation that's going to be moving forward, um, we're looking very much at a sort of perspective response right now and what can we do for the present and the future to deal with the kits that we know about in the audit. We are also looking through some federal opportunities in order to fund a wholesale approach here in the state, which many other states have taken under the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative. And um, there's some potential funding that can come from that. And we'll address that more with any questions. Um, just very briefly, and we're not going to talk much about the legislation today, but just to give you an idea of what came from the work group into the legislation is the definitions of the types of kits that we're talking about, the timelines for collection and submission, ensuring that there's communication between the different disciplines. And really first and foremost, we're thinking about the victims. So we wanna make sure that victims are able to locate and determine where their kit is in the process. They certainly can't get all of the details about the kit, but what they can do is at least find out if their kit has been submitted for tested and where it might be. And I really, really want to emphasize local coordination in this conversation. Um, at Mincasa, we are a federal technical assistance provider for multidisciplinary teaming. And we work with 13 different multidisciplinary sexual assault teams all over the state. 
And part of that is developing protocol to respond to all different parts of the system response. And kits are no different. And in fact, there's already teams around the state who have been addressing this issue and creating local protocols. And, and I'll be transparent, there's some areas still where we have a lot of work to do. And one of it is about storage of kits and who's handling kits, where do they sit? And we're really promoting at this point that local coordination is a big piece to how we work through that question. And we're hoping to have more support in the future to getting resources to some of the agencies around the state that may need them in order to handle those particular kits that come into their possession. I just wanna also kind of give the committee a little bit of an idea of the laws that we're dealing with here. And this is um, 609.35, and this is the section of our statute that has to do with kit payment and access to exams. And so essentially what it says in our county by county system, that the county where the sexual assault occurred is the one that is responsible for payment for collecting the evidence in the exam. And so if an exam takes place in Hennepin County, but the sexual assault occurred in Chisago County, Chisago County is the county that is responsible for the payment. Um, another piece of the, of the law says that the, victim, the victim's insurer can only be contacted if the victim has given permission for that to do so. So we are essentially as a community, as a state, as a culture saying that it's really important that we want to pay for these exams for victims out of you know, our county budgets that we are pre prepared to do that. Another really important piece, a very crucial piece of this, is that payment for an exam does not depend on the victim reporting the crime to law enforcement or prosecution or having any existence of an investigation or prosecution. And the reason why that is, is after a sexual assault, we may have health considerations as well as public safety considerations. And so we don't wanna create any barrier for somebody going to get health care in case they feel like um, oh, I'm not sure I want to report, but I'm injured. Something happened to me. We want to make sure that they get to the hospital, get the care that they need, and Linda Walter will be walking through what that looks like in a moment. And then they can decide whether or not they want to report after that. All of this really stems from the Federal Violence Against Women Act, and that actually does require states to um, provide um, these kits free of charge to victims. It also says that you can't require the report to law enforcement. And our state is in compliance, and we do receive a number of federal funds that help us in a great deal with our anti-crime work, with prosecution, with law enforcement, and those funds are tied to our compliance with these uh, forensic exam laws. And um, as I mentioned earlier, this is all about supporting victim choice, but we're also balancing that public safety and public health concern as we go through. Just wanted to list a couple of resources for you. As you know, this is a big national conversation and we're one of many, many states that are engaging in it. And all states are at different places. I know you've heard about some of the big numbers that have come out of Detroit or Memphis, you know, 12,000, 15,000, 16,000 kits. All of these areas are different. Everybody's handling these processes different. And I think here in our state, we've been uh, engaged in a very thoughtful process that's bringing in stakeholders we're recognizing where we have work to do still, but we're also ready to move forward and start to organize our process too. So the National Institute for Justice um, has put forward the national best practices for sexual assault kits, and we've referred to those, but also talked about what works here in Minnesota. So we're really customizing our law for Minnesota. Um, the Joyful Heart Foundation, um, and the backlog, that is a national campaign. Um, actress Mariska Hargitay is a big face with that. You might have seen some information about that. And then there's a sexual assault kit initiative grant process that is um, underway. That's the, the federal funding that we are potentially looking to. And actually Duluth already has one of these grants. And you'll be hearing a little bit about the Duluth response right now and how that has um, helped them to move through their unsubmitted kits. And so before I move forward to hear our other speakers, I'm happy to answer any uh, questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if you could uh, please state your name. 
Mr. Chair and members of the committee, my name is Linda Walther and I am a registered nurse and I'm also a sexual assault nurse examiner. That's, we often call ourselves SANE nurses, which I don't know is actually accurate or not, but um, I didn't realize I was so nervous until I got right here. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so I've been a sexual assault nurse examiner for more than 11 years. I have taken care of more than 700 patients in the time that I've been doing this. I currently work for two sexual assault programs in the metro area where we are dispatched to the hospital when someone presents to the emergency room following a sexual assault. Um, there are three programs in the metro area that do that. But where someone presents to the hospital really depends upon what kind of care they're going to receive when they do. So if, you, if you're um, a victim of sexual violence and you go to a metro hospital, um, a SANE nurse is going to be called to see you. If you are living in um, Dawson, Minnesota or um, Redwood Falls or Roseau, Minnesota, it's just going to be whoever's available at that time in the hospital taking care of you, whether they've had training on how to do that exam or not. So that the, the response is vastly different across the state. And like Caroline mentioned earlier, is that I also have been working with Minkaza to do some um, education of staff in those more rural outstate Minnesota hospitals to give them the knowledge on how to do that sexual assault exam because no medical professional likes to do a uh, procedure that they don't know what they're doing because that, that just never feels good. But basically, um, when, um, sorry, so the, the medical forensic exam or the sexual assault exam is a two-part exam, and it's really the most important part of it, and maybe because I'm a nurse I feel that way, is that it's the medical care that we give to those patients who come to the hospital following a sexual assault. And then the secondary part of it is that forensic component where we're collecting swabs, looking for biological fluids or specimens on um, the victim's body. Uh, I was on call on Sunday night and th I think this kind of is a good example of the kinds of patients that we see is that as a young, um, I was called to a hospital in the metro area to take care of a young woman who had been sexually assaulted by an unknown acquaintance. Um, she came to the hospital, she was really scared and she was really emotional and in a lot of pain and she really didn't even know what she wanted. She was just brought there by her mom because she knew that she needed some care. And um, as soon as she came to the hospital, they called um, a SANE nurse, and I just happened to be the nurse that responded that night. And um, she had no idea what to expect, and so I was able to give her kind of a rundown of all of the things that we do. And um, so the first thing that I talked to the, our patients about is giving consent, consent for that exam, because something was done to them without their consent, and I feel like consent is so important for them. We do a really brief medical history, and then we take the account of the incident that they tell us um, what was done to them in really detailed um, documentation because that guides our exam, helps us decide what kinds of evidence we want to collect. And after that, we do a head-to-toe exam looking for any injuries. We're doing a really detailed documentation of those injuries. We're taking photographs of those injuries and um, collecting any evidence from the body. And once we do that, we are doing, um, I guess I should, Bring out. This is our, what the sexual <coughs> kit looks like. It's um, a very small box, but can be very powerful for victims when it's collected. I'll just pass that around. And that's the Minnesota kit that we use here. So we get to our genital exam, whether the patient is male or female, because about 10% of our patients are um, males. And we're going to do a really detailed genital um, exam and we use an instrument called a speculum to look inside the vagina to be able to collect swabs um, from the inside. Um, and then if the patient um, has, a, has been rectally penetrated, we also have another device that we use called an anoscope where we're looking inside the rectum for injury and doing documentation, collecting swabs from those areas. Um, after that, we're going to make sure that we give medications to prevent any sexually transmitted infections because the risk is pretty high of um, being exposed to sexually transmitted infections. And some of them, if left untreated, can cause permanent and long-term health consequences. Um, so my patient on, on uh, Sunday night, she didn't really even want me to talk to her. She didn't even know what um, 
she needed. And just through that whole process of me explaining to her, just like I did to you, what the exam entails, she was able to finally decide that it would be okay for me to talk to her. And then with a little bit of more education, a little bit of gentle um, encouragement in explaining her options, she was able to decide yes, then she just wanted me to do that exam and look for injuries. And she had a lot of genital trauma that I was able to document and be able to explain to her what, what that looks like and what that means for her future. And then um, talk to her about sexually transmitted infections and get her those medications um, because she was at a, she was kind of at a high risk for acquiring HIV from that sexual assault. So able to discuss that with her and get her those medications. And then talk to her about reporting. Now she was someone who is not very interested in reporting because she's um, from a community that doesn't have always have a great relationship with law enforcement. So we're able to explain that if you want to report to law enforcement, we can call them to come to the hospital right now and take that report, or you can go home and get some sleep. And because we've collected this evidence, you know, that's of time is of the essence with the evidence collection, that you can go home and sleep and then work with advocacy to make a report to law enforcement, maybe the next day, maybe a week from now, even maybe a year from now, because we've collected this evidence that keeps your options open. And so she decided that she wasn't ready to talk to law enforcement, but that we had planted that, um, that idea in her head that she could be safe to do that in, in the future. Hey, I, <clears throat> Walter, I believe Representative Howe has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess when, you, when obtaining that release, is, that, is there a different process when you're dealing with minors as, as adults? Or, or in, and how does that work when you're dealing with uh, with with minors in that re respect uh, mr. chair and representative how um, the way that that works is that in we consider that minors are able to um, give consent for their care under that I that um, statute that talks about them being able to have um, sexual health care and uh, mental health and chemical health care and uh, so that's how we do that exam generally People, are, you know, generally our minors have their parents there if they wanted to give consent, but we would always have the patient give consent. Did I answer your question? Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess sometimes I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that sometimes we may be looking at the perpetrator may be a parent or a guy, guardian. So I'm just wondering how that is, how that's done to uh, <coughs> maybe obtain that release. And I'm not quite sure what the legal status of all that is maybe there I'm sure there's other people in here that have dealt with this a lot more than I have that would understand that I guess I just don't know if if that carries any weight or how that's done maybe somebody in the can help me with that oh well, Ms. Walter do you answer that or um, Mr. Chairman and or Ms. Mr. Chair, sorry. <laughs> this is like so like outside my normal thing. Like I'm like Dr. <laughs> this, right? Um, um, yes, in that we, I, I mean, it doesn't happen very often that we're concerned that the, the <coughs> parent or guardian that's with the minor is the perpetrator. Um, but certainly because the, the minor is able to give consent to the exam, that helps us sort of, sort of fund nest that and make sure that we are acting in the best interest of that minor. And Caroline says that we Thank also, um, which like I can't believe I forgot this, but um, is that nurses as well were mandated reporters. So um, if it, there is any of that kind of concern, then we would always make that mandated report, whether it's a minor or a vulnerable adult as well. Thank you. I, could, you I was just continue. going to, just the last thing that I was going to add is that because we have these many different um, varied options for reporting, um, what happens when the patient is leaving the hospital? So an exam can take anywhere from two to four hours and then we have like a lot of paperwork to do. Um, but what we do with, the, um, with the, the actual kit itself is that in the hospitals, um, if they're reported, then we call law enforcement to pick those, um, those kits up. If they have not made a report and they're that restricted kit, um, usually the hospitals will store them for a specific amount of time. And that varies widely across the metro area. Um, it's hospital based and then it, it, it's very different across the whole state as well. So there's really no standardization of how long those kits are left or are kept. And we know that 
you know, usually if somebody's going to make a report, they do it rather quickly. It's in the first couple of weeks, but we know also that a year is an important, at the anniversary of the sexual assault, they may then decide. And I've heard of patients who have reported even later than that. So um, that's kind of how we, we want to keep it for as long as we possibly can to keep those victims options open. I know just to give a little context to, to what we're talking about, I work for these two different same programs in the metro area and one of them is in Hennepin County and last year we saw over a thousand patients in Hennepin County for sexual assault and the metro or the north metro program saw um, over 600 patients and in um, Ramsey and Washington County, the pro other program that I work for, we saw close to 400 patients. So it's a pretty large number of people that are coming to the hospital just in the metro area. Well, thank you. Uh, Representative O'Neill, I believe you have a question. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for your testimony. It was fun working with you on the working group and, and delving in. And this was really the first time I'd opened up a kit. You know, I think you had them at the table before, but to see that there are 12 different sets of swabs and the very extensive interview, it's, it's really mind boggling. And that I think we need to, if you haven't opened the kit, I think it's really important to do that and to look at what it's labeled as because it's really, um, it's really a powerful statement as to how thorough it, and actually kind of invasive in a sense the the exam is and what a woman has to go through. So she's been victimized and then she has to go through that very extensive, extensive exam and that again trunk just um, emphasizes how important that we treat all the kits with respect, the person with respect and the process with respect because she's been through so much. Um, also, I think it's important to understand for the committee too to look at if there's 12 different swabs, which means that's 12 different DNA um, samples that they ha they have to run 12 different once it gets to the BCA, and the BCA can talk about this too. But you know, once they um, once the BCA collects that, so there's 12 different DNA samples they have to go through, not just one. You know, it, it's sort of simplistic to think that a kit might have a swab, but it's actually 12 different swabs depending on what's happened to her. Um, and then there's also the whole other bit of evidence that might be collected. Maybe it's bedding, maybe it's clothing, maybe it's other things that have to have uh, samples done and taken to kind of put the fuller picture there. And not only keeping the kit for whatever determination that we decide uh, legislatively, because it really isn't a determination in law right now, how long to keep that kit, but it's also all of the other evidence, her clothing, um, the bedding, and other things that she may have come in contact with. So um, just so that we all have a, a bigger picture of what we're really talking about. And I think opening the kit was eye-opening to me to realize there's 12 swabs in there. So that's a lot of evidence just in that small kit. So I appreciate you coming and working with this and all that you do to you know protect women and to stand up for them. So I thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, to kind of jump off of uh, Representative O'Neill, I. I just thought it was important to emphasize um, the the gravity and how invasive this can be, and especially in the way that it can potentially exacerbate the trauma that the person has already experienced, and kind of putting that together with you know why people maybe don't report or don't um, you know choose not to to go in and have the entire exam done. It really is a, a great. Um, undertaking for someone and and to that to the um, I'm very concerned about the access to fully trained uh, nurses and doctors in rural Minnesota and I'm, I'm guessing not all of those facilities also have the um, equipment that you uh, you know or the expertise in using the equipment which then you know in in addition to making the maybe the evidence not what we would like to see on a prosecutor end but then the lack of training could then exacerbate the trauma even further if it's not someone who's trained in how to to deal with these situations you know you did a really great job of explaining your, you know a specific case and how your expertise and and background helped you help help that woman to get to a place that was more helpful for her and you know if we don't have people that are trained uh, you know every person in every woman in Minnesota who experiences this should have access to the same level of care um, and this also ties in with the other issue we've talked a lot about in the last year with um, violence that's done to Native women 
and a lot of those women are in our rural areas too. So it's just a lot of um, really important issues. And so I just thought it was really important to point those things out and, and what you've mentioned already. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming today. Um, I don't see any other questions. I just uh, also wanted to say thank you for the work you do. Thank you. I've uh, investigated a number of sexual assault cases and the best cases I've been able to put together is from the work that the examining nurses have done, talking to the victim, victims, working with them. Generally, the nurses are the first ones to see these victims. And how you handle them makes a huge difference in the investigation to put the uh, perpetrators behind bars. So thank you. I want to thank all of you and Mr. Chair as well, um, because I feel like you know I can do the, the work on the ground, but you know, I don't have the power to make changes at a state -like, statewide level that will affect all victims. And I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me talk about this. That's why we're here. Uh, next, uh, Bill Hutton. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Representatives. My name is Bill Hutton, um, the executive director, the new executive director of the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. I'm a retired uh, sheriff from Washington County and uh, spent 33 years in law enforcement, many of those years as an investigator, probably 15 years as an investigator. So I too agree with your comment, Mr. Chair, about what an unbelievable job that the same nurses do and nurses do to uh, help make the case. My role is to just uh, give a rather quick overview of um, what happens with the kits as we, as the investigation moves forward and how it ends up in the hands of the BCA. Um, but I will also touch a little bit on what was uh, originally provided to us by uh, Linda here, the nurse. Um, the kits get to the hospitals in a couple of different ways. First, some, the hospitals may already have the kits or Law enforcement is contacted, and I can reference this from a, a being in a Metro investigator and sheriff, is we would bring the kit because we have the personnel, we'd be able to bring the kit immediately to the hospital. That kit is sealed. Once, this, once the kit is handed over to the nurses, the same nurses, it is unsealed. And law enforcement has absolutely nothing to do with the kit at that moment. Any of the sealing, any of the collection, any of that kind of stuff is all done by the same nurse or the hospital staff. And to your point, Representative O'Neill, about the collection of clothing and those that bedding and that kind of stuff, that is also what law enforcement participates in that. But with regards to the kit, absolutely, uh, we do not do anything to do with that. Um, any and all evidence uh, gathered by the hospital personnel is signed over to law enforcement. So there is a very strict chain of custody that occurs. Um, it's just not here you go. Um, the signatures have, sometimes there's multiple forms that are signed between the hospital and law enforcement to make sure that that chain of uh, custody is intact. Uh, for those reported cases, for those cases that law enforcement is, are going to be actively investigating, uh, there's also releases of information that need to be signed. Um, sometimes law enforcement provide that release to the hospital, but more often, especially within the metro, they have their own release of information that will be given to the victim and then turned over to law enforcement. Law enforcement then takes that evidence, takes that kit, bring it back to their prospective uh, law enforcement agency, and then that kit is introduced into evidence. Again, a very strict chain of custody occurs. Um, so the law enforcement officer, either the uniform personnel or the uh, investigative personnel, they introduce that into their evidence room, at which point it's logged in and kept in the evidence room for a period of time. That period of time can be 12 hours, 24 hours, five, six days before then it is uh, taken out of evidence again, chain of custody, and brought down to the uh, Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. All the while that is occurring, obviously the investigative process has taken place along the way. Now the kit is just not brought to the BCA and said, here's your kit. Uh, there's a very significant process that needs to occur as well. Uh, there's multiple chain of custody forms that need to be signed. Uh, there's also significant data that needs to be relayed uh, through a multi-page form uh, to the BCA 
in the evidence area. So again, it's just not turned over and say, here, test it. There's lots of uh, investigative data. There's lots of data that was collected by the hospital. There's lots of data collected by law enforcement officers that need to go onto that form to assist the BCA in their analysis of that data. Um, this um, can occur. This, I, I, the perspective that I give you is a perspective as a uh, investigator in the metro area. Obviously, it changes as was already made reference to by both your previous speakers about the issues that, not issues, how different it can be throughout the state. Meaning sometimes the hospitals will maintain the evidence for a period of time before law enforcement comes in and collects it. Again, chain of custody issues along the way. So I just gave you a kind of a quick overview and perspective as to what happens within the metro area uh, with regards to the sexual assault kits. Representative Zerwaz. Well, thank you for the overview, uh, Mr. Hutton. And I'm wondering if you could speak to um, law enforcement in um, maintaining and retaining uh, kits that um, perhaps the sexual contact isn't disputed. Um, you interview an, a suspect or an individual and he says the, the sexual contact was consensual um, or um, a case where an individual decides uh, not to move forward with charges, uh, an exceptionally clear type case. Give you a little bit of perspective. When I worked for five years at the Anoka County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, we had um, over the years accumulated significant numbers of uh, uh, sexual assault kits that for one investigative reason or another were deemed of no evidentiary value or didn't need to move forward. And so can you walk through kind of when you were sheriff of Washington County, that experience and how those kits were handled? One of the challenges, one of the things I'm trying to address is we talk about 3,000 kits uh, in the inventory that weren't tested. Um, and I think that doesn't always give a complete uh, picture where there are um, not most likely 3,000 kits that just didn't get sent in or financially we couldn't afford to test or, um, but a significant portion, or at least when I was uh, with Anoka County, of the significant portion of sexual assault kits that were not forwarded to the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for testing were done so deliberately out of an investigative process because that's not where the investigation led. And so I'm wondering if you can kind of talk to, to those issues a little bit. Mr. Rep. Mr. Chairman, Representative, that's kind of a multi-faceted question with lots of little twists and turns in there. Not every investigation is like the one before. There's always something else happening within the investigative process. Uh, however, it is evidence. Um, in the investigative process, if the kit was not forwarded to the BCA for analysis and the victim uh, he or she changed their mind as to whether or not they would like to move forward with the investigation. Obviously, that's going to have an effect on the investigation. Um, so there are multiple things that can, and I think you described it in your question, there are multiple things that can occur where some kits may not be brought forward. Um, my experience in Washington County, as you referred to, evidence is evidence, and it, regardless it needs to be treated as such. Now there's going to be certain facets, I think as you described, that will have an effect as to how it's, whether or not it moves forward. But the reality is those sexual assault kits are very, very important pieces of evidence that needed to be treated as such. <coughs> Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Thank you, Representative Zerwas. It was something that I was hoping we would have as a conversation coming out. And I'm sure when the BCA comes, they can kind of explain of the, tits, the kits that are still yet untested, what are the reasons behind that? And a lot of it has to do with it just doesn't have evidentiary value or these cases have been closed or the, the woman decides not to pursue charges and continue the case. Um, but they're gonna explain that as well, I believe, when they come up. But um, in the legislation that we're just gonna 
reference, we did talk about making sure that there was evidentiary value to moving the kit forward so we don't inundate the BCA. And something in the working group that I felt was really important, members, is to understand that at the time we started the working group, the BCA could handle about 1,000 kits per year. So if we, we have 3,400 and, well, we don't have that many untested anymore because the, the important ones have been tested. But say if we sent them 3,000 at one time, it would really, it would, it wouldn't give justice to the women that are waiting and have an open and ready case. And so we need to be very mindful of that in the conversation moving forward. But in the legislation that we'll be talking about at a later time, it's very clearly spelled out that that kit has to have evidentiary value to move forward. Um, you know, if, if it's a consent, you know, you know who the man is and there's a consent issue, that's not that doesn't have value to move forward. The kit in a whole might, because you can see uh, the violence of the act, but the actual DNA uh, profile is, is not of, of value. So just to clarify that as we move forward too. And thank you for your testimony. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Superintendent Drew Evans. <clears throat> it looks like we have uh, Deputy Superintendent Catherine Knutson at the same time. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And as noted, I have with me Deputy Superintendent of Forensic Science Services, Catherine Knutson. She's going to walk you through um, the pieces related to the laboratory. I just thought I'd stop up to um, comment on this last piece as well when it comes to the um, untested kits in the state of Minnesota. Kathy will uh, maybe touch briefly on a program we are working on with a grant with the Duluth Police Department working through some of these kits, but I just want to affirm that it would be difficult for us to take in the 3,000 or so remaining kits in the state of Minnesota. The kits that are remaining that are still with law enforcement, I just want to note, have a variety of different reasons why they've been untested from um, the reason it wouldn't be valuable to the case from a prosecutorial standpoint, the victim may be uncooperative in a particular investigation, it may have been adjudicated. The case has already gone all the way through uh, the legal system and so that has been completed so they didn't uh, submit that. We have been in contact with a number of agencies around Minnesota when the original survey went out with kits that um, we believed should be potentially examined by those agencies and we've been in direct communication with a number of those agencies around the state. So I will turn it over to uh, Kathy Knudsen. Welcome, go ahead. All right. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Catherine Knudsen. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and I oversee the Forensic Science Services, so the crime lab aspect of this. Um, so uh, you do have an info sheet in front of you, I think, and I really just want to touch on about four major topics as it pertains to the sexual assault evidence collection kits and when they finally kind of um, finish their journey through the hospital, through law enforcement, and then ultimately end up at the forensic laboratory. Before I get into that, Mr. I do Chair, want... I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I don't think everyone has the, the BCA sheet. Some do, some don't. Is there any, anybody not have this up on this? Yeah, is that him? Oh, Representative Lusaro. I have a question. As long as we're on a break. <coughs> Representative Constantine. I just had a quick question. May I ask that now, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. If the case has already been adjudicated, why do you keep the kit? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Considine, you know, there's a number of uh, retention schedules that law enforcement maintains with a particular kit, and they usually will follow them. Uh, and so they will hold evidence, not just in these types of cases, but all cases for a, a period of time. They're often designed by whether or not it still could be useful, if there were any appeals in a particular case. There's a whole variety of reasons, but they tend to set very um, deliberate schedules, regardless if they've been. Um, adjudicated or not to make it for the ease of when evidence should or should not be destroyed in a particular case. And that varies from case type to case type. <coughs> yeah. Mr. Chair. Oh, Representative Lush. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, um, thank you for your latitude in allowing a non-member to, to sit at the table as well. There are a few members uh, sitting around this table who are around, uh, including uh, Representative Hillstrom, a um, handful, I couldn't point them all now, though, who, when we crafted changes for the retention of this as evidence based upon the then trending exoneration mm -hmm. issues in the news about going back and testing for potential uh, exoneration of people who were, you know, convicted and they shouldn't have been based on DNA evidence. So it's got it's got a little bit of history that I'm not trying to dredge up now, but I just wanted to say that that we wrestled that with that for a while, Representative Constable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, please continue. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, first, before I get into what happens to a kit when it reaches the the bureau, I want to talk about the kit itself. You did have an opportunity to take a look at those kits and to see the extensive nature of the different types of evidence that is present <coughs> within those kits. And those kits were really designed very specifically to streamline the process, both on the collection aspect, but then also in the forensic laboratory. It was to standardize those kits many years ago. And those kits are um, specifically designed by the VCA, <coughs> ordered by the VCA, and um, provided free of charge to anyone within the medical facilities or the law enforcement facilities who request these kits. And we send out approximately 2,000 of these kits a year so that they can be used in the, um, in the collection of the evidence of this, of this nature. Okay, so when they make their trip through the law enforcement. Um, they know we are notified. Uh, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, getting back to the kit specifically, you said that you distribute about 2,000. Do the kits have an expiration? Is there anything inside the kit that um, causes if that's perishable? Oh, this one does. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Knutson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hillstrom, uh, yes, there is one portion of the kit that does have an expiration date, and it pertains to the blood tube that is used to collect a known blood sample. And really, the expiration is kind of is on that seal. Um, so that can be something, a portion of those kits that can be switched out within a hospital facility. So the kit itself, as a whole, can be used uh, past the expiration date of its components. Thank you. Uh, please continue. Thank you. So the submission of the kits, um, when we, we, we test approximately, um, probably up to upwards of 1,000 criminal sexual conduct cases at the BCA annually, majority of those cases do uh, come in with evidence that includes a sexual assault kit. Um, we are notified by law enforcement. They are submitted. Uh, you already heard about the extensive chain of custody <coughs> paperwork. We have streamli streamlined our submission paperwork significantly, so it is no longer multi-page. It is really very specific to each type of case. So we try to make the submission process as easy on our submitting agencies as, as we can. Uh, we require a, a significant amount of information, and mainly because that information is used to help drive the testing of that kit. Uh, you saw there are 12 plus swabs, there are mi miscellaneous types of evidence within those kits. It is not necessary to test every single one of those pieces of evidence in the information that comes in along with those kits. Helps us to test these kits, streamline them, and really test for the best evidence in every single case to give the best possible chance to assist in the investigation downstream. Okay. So upon submission, typically these cases will go to our biology section. It is important to note also that biology is the obvious choice for the testing for these kits. However, there are a significant amount of these kits that come in with additional evidence that requires testing for alcohol in the presence of drugs. So our toxicology section is also um, involved in the testing of sexual assault cases. Once the kit is submitted to the laboratory, um, it is forwarded to the biology unit where it is assessed for um, where it's going to go, what's the procedure going to be, the case specifics are utilized in order to determine the best possible path, and that first step is really the identification typically of a biological fluid. To go through each of the items of evidence within the kit, determine whether or not there is a presence of a biological fluid, and whether or not subsequent DNA testing is going to be helpful for the case. Approximately 70 to 70, 70 to 75 percent of those cases do end up moving toward DNA testing. Now that used to be lower. 
um, but because of the technologies that are currently employed at the BCA and the, um, the ability to detect DNA on much older samples, on samples with much less um, biological fluids, we are able to now forward more of these into DNA to get useful information than we used to. So once we identify a bio biological fluid, it is forwarded to DNA. We can test it using various techniques. Techniques typically we will just do our normal nuclear DNA testing, which you are probably quite familiar with. That's the one that everybody has heard about. Um, and then there's also a different type of testing that we can do to target male DNA. And that's a useful um, examination that uh, we can use in specific types of cases where there is expected to be a very low level of male DNA in, a, in the environment of a lot of female DNA. So it's essentially finding the needle in the haystack. I believe Representative Brooklyn has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Assistant Superintendent. Yeah, I have a little question about DNA, uh, a couple of them actually. How long does it actually take for the DNA test before you get results back? And does it vary based on the nuclear type or the other t test method? Mr. Chair, Representative Ugalum, <clears throat> uh, it depends. Uh, honestly, the, the test itself doesn't take that terribly long. It's truly how long it takes us to get to the kit in the queue, which is what takes the mo which contributes to the turnaround time the most. Um, obviously, if the more t pieces of evidence within that kit that we need to test, the longer it's going to take, which is why we try to focus on one or two key pieces of evidence per kit to um, maximize the amount of information that we're going to be able to obtain. And then if it is a difficult, complex kit, we will have to do additional testing, and then that will add some time as well. But if it's a straightforward kit with one item, the testing itself could be done in a matter of a couple of days. Um, but then it goes through all of our approval processes. So the best case scenario would be a three-day turnaround time. And we do do that for some very high priority cases that come in that involve children or have an immediate risk to public safety. Representative Ugram. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then uh, uh, one other question. Is there a difference in the accuracy of the DNA uh, test methods? Deputy Knudsen. Mr. Chair, um, Representative, there is no difference in the accuracy. All of the examinations and the technologies that we use have been validated and are utilized according to our procedures. So the accuracy is not necessarily in question. Um, I think you might be referencing how much information can we obtain based on the technology. And it really depends on the case itself. If it is a case that comes in, it was collected immediately following the assault. There was, an, uh, there was a transfer of biological fluids. We're going to have a much easier time identifying those, those, those fluids and doing a DNA test on them. If this is a case of a situation where it may have been um, a delay in reporting, uh, potential very minimal transmission of biological fluids, say it's a touch DNA case, where only a digital penetration or something along those lines may have happened. We're dealing with a much smaller amount of DNA that we're targeting. So we're going to get less results from that typically. Okay, thank you. Uh, please continue. Okay, so I think I got through the different types of DNA testing that can be performed at the laboratory. Um, at that point in time, we can come up with various levels of, of results. Um, when a kit comes in, it's usually not the only piece of evidence that comes in. Uh, many of the cases that come in come in with known suspects or individuals who are known to the case. We need, or elimination samples such as consensual partners, et cetera. We're going to also test those known DNA samples from those individuals so that they can be con compared to the evidence DNA profile that's obtained from the kit. That can lead to um, either a match to a known suspect, it could lead to a match to a consensual partner, in which case the case is done and we've done what we can as it pertains to DNA, or potentially it matches no one or it's a non-suspect case. And in that case, in many of the other cases, those DNA profiles that are obtained from the evidence can now be entered into the state or the national DNA index system, which is more commonly known as CODIS. Okay, so. Representative Newberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the testifier, what's the state paying for each one of these individually? What's your cost? Uh, yep. uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Newberger, we 
each kit, it, each kit costs approximately $8. $8? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please continue. And I'd like to um, clarify that that's just the, ex the expense of the kit itself, not the testing aspect of the kit. The testing is a little bit more expensive. <laughs> Representative Hilston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So you referenced that once the um, case investigation pieces comes up with DNA, there are standards under which you can enter it into CODIS. Um, once some of these cases um, are resolved, so there's no evidentiary value. Is there no value in actually processing those cases for the purposes of entering them into the CODIS database? Deputy Knudsen. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Pilstrom, the no evidentiary value uh, statement, I believe, is, is to the case at hand. And there are many interpretations of what that can mean. Um, I think many of those were covered. Uh, by Mr. Hutton earlier regarding whether it's a consent issue or there was no information that supports any sort of a physical contact. So whatever we find in the kit may not have any specific impact on the case itself. As it pertains to CODIS, uh, the FBI does have very specific rules as to what qualifies for entry into that DNA database. And one of those rules is that it must be, there has to be evidence of a crime that was committed. And that's one that we, re we rely upon when we uh, make the determination as to what sort of examinations we will do and what sort of, of um, cases we'll accept. If, it, if a crime has been committed, basic definition of that, um, and the DNA profile that is obtained is likely to have come from the punitive perpetrator and it meets the minimum qualifications for data quality, then we will put it into CODIS. Representative Hilstrom. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. And so maybe this is a better question for the working group. Did you have, uh, and maybe Representative O'Neill, um, did you have conversations about these cases where, um, you know, there were specific decisions not to send them in for testing because consent was not, or because consent was the issue, not who did it, um, and whether or not there was value in getting that DNA for the purposes of CODIS, because you know um, if there's a conviction that a crime happened. Mm -hmm. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to have Carolyn come up because there was a large stakeholder group and then there was a whole bunch of smaller subgroups. And there, I think there might have been about 100 people or so working on that. So I don't know exactly in every single subgroup what the conversation was. Um, but I, I'm understanding, I believe, though, if it was a conviction, then the DNA would be loaded into CODIS. Maybe uh, Ms. Knudsen could verify that or not. But then I'll let Carolyn talk about what happened in the working group. Uh, Ms. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hillstrom, and, and consent is a, is a big conversation, absolutely. And um, so some of the pieces that we talked about, and, and this is a conversation that goes on on the national level too, is, you know, are there instances in which it, it might be useful to, to bring that evidence forward? And um, could there potentially be links to other cases out there that might show up? In a database, mm -hmm. and a good example of that would be um, some of the case, some of the situations you're hearing about in Detroit, for example, or Cleveland, where they had really high number of cases. They did um, find hits out of consent cases too, and so um, as we've been having these conversations, I, I think I want to be clear. I don't think there's like a wholesale overruling or leaving out consent cases. I think there's many many factors that will come into that conversation. But I think um, at the end of the day, we want to make sure as many kits go through as possible because there are potentials for getting additional information about other cases. M Mr. Chair, follow up. Representative Hilstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So then ultimately, who makes the decision um, in a consent type case as to whether or not it's going to be forwarded? Well, the way we have looked at it through our process right now is um, there is a consideration of um, through law enforcement of which kits will be forwarded, but what we also included in our proposed legislation is consultation with prosecution. Um, and if for some reason a kit is not going forward, that would have to be something that is recorded in consultation with the county attorney's office. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, um, if um, Ms. Knudsen could just uh, answer the one question about after conviction, does that DNA then get loaded into CODIS? Uh, Ms. Knudsen. Yes, Mr. Chair, Representative O'Neill. 
Um, when, it, when we deal with convictions, that's really a different side of the house. That's not necessarily the evidence in the case that goes into um, the database. That's on the investigative side of things the, when we do the testing. After the fact, um, when an individual is convicted of a qualifying crime for uh, per the state statute, then a known sample is submitted, and that is then entered into the database and put into the convicted offender side of the database. Representative Zeroes. And Mr. Chair, and I think that's what's really important is <coughs> post-conviction that known offender, convicted offender <coughs> sample is, is loaded up. And so um, you don't have an incident where convicted individuals are potentially um, not being identified or tracked back to previous crimes because it's their known samples being uploaded at the, at the time of conviction versus the idea that um, we need to test every single case, even when uh, sexual contact isn't being uh, disputed, um, to upload in order to track back other crimes. That's done, uh, can be done on the back end through the post conviction database. Mr. Chair. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. But it's my understanding that it's only a felony level conviction that results in the DNA testing. Um, if there is a, if you have up front in the testing DNA and it results in a conviction that is not a felony, do you keep the database from the evidence in CODIS or do you take it out? Because otherwise you only get the felony convictions um, DNA post conviction. Uh, Deputy Knudsen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hillstrom. That is correct. The convicted offender samples are only submitted uh, per state statute, and that is at this point all felonies and or any um, conviction that arose from an initial charge of a felony. So what does happen for the cases that, lim that resulted in forensic evidence from the kit, that evidence data, if it qualifies, will go to the database on the forensic database and it will stay there regardless of conviction. Okay. Thank you. Please continue. All right. So I think now is a good time to explain a little bit more about what makes up CODIS and I've mentioned a couple of the various databases. It is uh, divvied up into a handful of databases. One of them is the database that houses the convicted offender data. Uh, those are profiles that are, are collected here in the state of Minnesota and across the United States per state statute. Uh, and then there's also an arrestee database. There are several states that have active arrestee laws. That database houses those, those samples. And then there's the forensic database. And the forensic database is the database where all of these uh, DNA profiles from the kits and evidence from all cr pretty cr at any crime, really, across the United States will be entered into. And these database searches then um, compare to each other. So the forensic index, these kits, so a DNA profile is obtained from a kit, it's put in the forensic index, and then over the course of time, immediately and then ongoing as new samples are added, is compared to the convicted offender database, the arrestee database nationally, and other samples within the forensic index. And we can obtain match results or hits from any of those databases. At that point in time, we will confirm these hits with uh, the information we may have about those particular cases. We will report those hits to local to the submitting agency. We will, at times when it's appropriate, depending on the type of hit that it is, we will provide information about the offender that it hit to, um, as well as any cases that it hit to. So if there's a case-to-case -case hit, we will provide that information because there may be additional information in the other hit cases that could assist in the investigation of the case at hand. That information is relayed to the submitting agency for uh, further follow-up um, or whatever, wherever it may be sitting or wherever it, wherever it might um, be with their current investigation into their case. Um, when we have a hit to a convicted offender sample, we additionally require a known, additional known sample to be submitted. So we, we ask that the law enforcement agency goes out, finds this individual and gets another known sample so that we can confirm that hit. And then at that point in time, those cases are complete. Hey, Ms. Ms. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the, the CODIS, is the evidentiary 
offer, is that just for sex, sexual assault? Or if it was a burglary or something like that, would that uh, DNA be put in that system as well? Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. The CODIS forensic index is for all cases. It's not specific to sexual assaults, but there are a fair amount of sexual assault cases in there. Thank you. Any other questions by the members? <coughs> well, thank you. Mr. Chair, may I just have a couple would of closing you, remarks? Yep, would you like to wrap up? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the committee, and I want to say thank you to all of our testifiers. Through this work group process, I think we have really grown to appreciate the challenges and difficulties in all of this work, and I know I certainly have I mean, grown to understand how much goes on at the BCA just to start with and everywhere else. I also want to thank Representative O'Neill for being our champion on this issue. She's come to some of the work group meetings, really dug in and understood the information. And uh, we're really pleased to have such great partnerships here in the legislature. The other thing I just wanted to bring your attention to, to know that's also kind of going on alongside this, and this kind of gets to Representative Hillstrom's question too, is training, and I mentioned earlier, um, we're trying to do more training for sexual assault nurse examiners, but we're also doing that for law enforcement and other parts of the system that will be encountering victims. And one of that piece is trauma-informed investigation techniques and making sure that we are doing our very best on the front end when we're working with victims to get as much information that we can, that we can understand, you know, not from a neuroscientist level, but at least some level of the biology of trauma and how people respond. Because I think sometimes we, we we know that there are myths in our in our culture really about sexual assault. We still kind of go back to he said and she said and things like that. Um, better understanding of trauma and the way we use that in in law enforcement investigations. Uh, Linda uses trauma informed investigations when she works with her patients. Um, county attorneys sometimes use a trauma informed approach when they are examining witnesses on the stand. So all the different ways that we can change that can also make a difference in how we're moving cases through the system. So I just want to say thank you to everybody again and um, we look forward to further conversations. Well, thank you, thank you and thank you for the uh, group that did a <clears throat> very thorough look at this issue. Um, most, I believe most of the members have a copy of the uh, bill that was dropped yesterday for them to go over the next few days. And <clears throat> if you have any questions about it, uh, I believe it's Marion O'Neill's bill, so she'll be able to answer those questions for you. Um, that's going to be about wrapping it up for today. I do have one announcement pursuant to rule, House Rule 4.31 on Thursday, House Files 1669 and 1605 will be added to the agenda. And with that, we will be adjourned. Thank you.